Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this talk came out of my presentation last year, where at the end, Keith hijacked me and asked me for my four design tips for voice, and I have 10 at least, so I couldn't really <laughs> respond succinctly. Um, so I just thought it'd be interesting for you guys to see. Um, I've got 10 minutes and a little bit of intro means less than a minute per, per tip, so hopefully I can do it justice. But uh, we had a good chat on the Wireless Ninja podcast a few months ago where we covered it. So if you want to hear more, we spent about 45 minutes on the Wireless Ninja's 13 podcast talking about it. So go ahead and, and dig into that. You're not going to like all of these uh, suggestions, I should add. Um, go back, it's my time, it doesn't start. Yeah, you're not going to like all these suggestions. It comes down to what is your uh, most important client. And I don't like the term least capable. I'll just say most picky, you know. Um, so if voice is one of your most important clients and it's the most demanding rather than the, the least capable, then, then you need to do these, whether you like them or not, if you want to have a good experience. So everyone knows, you know, at least one access point at minus 67 everywhere. Ideally, we want two access points at minus 67 to give us good transition and to give us a redundancy. If an AP goes down, another one will pick us up at a significant signal point. So when you actually graph that and overlap, and obviously these perfect circles these antennas make, um, that means you're going to have a lot of APs very close together. Channel plan. I know you guys want to use loads and loads of channels. But we used to manage with just three or four channels in a very crowded and polluted 2.4 gigahertz band, and we made voice work. I have plenty of customers making voice work in 2.4 right now because they can't afford to get five dense enough to support it. So we don't need a huge channel plan to make five gigahertz work. You can make it work perfectly well with a small channel plan uh, on five gigahertz. I'm not saying three or four channels, but we don't need to go to 21. Uh, a lot of voice devices will scan all configured channels. Um, you know, as, as I said yesterday, both serial, you can configure the channel plan, but if you're using an iPhone to do Skype or FaceTime or whatever, you can't tell it the channel plan. In which case, you know, it's gonna be scanning all the channels. The less it finds, the less it will scan as it goes through. Um, and we only have four non-DFS channels in Europe um, and the UK. I think I might have seen Mark say something about um, the Netherlands having another four that nobody seems to know about. Um, but in general, most of Europe only has the four. So again, the, the moment you go to a big channel plan, you're adding in DFS channels, which we will look at their impact in just a second. So my recommendation when customers ask me what to use is if they're doing indoor support only, I just go 36 to 64 in a nice straight line, nice and easy, eight channels. I can roam through those, four DFS, four non-DFS, and, and voice can have a good experience. When they're trying to support transitions between buildings, I tend to say 100 to 112 for your four outside DFS channels, and you drop off the, the Uni2 channels. That'd be my recommendation to most people. And you know, as I proved yesterday, 11K is great, so turn that on because voice just wants as little roaming to do as possible. So by reducing the channel plan down, then we can focus on where we need to go um, and, and not spend too much time doing the, the, the scanning. Well, I've gone over my 50 seconds there. Um, so avoid DFS. I wrote a nice long blog on it a couple of months ago. So again, can't do it justice here, but if you wanna know why I don't like DFS, go and read about it on my blog. Uh, but to give you the highlights, DFS channels take a lot of scanning time and time is the enemy of voice when you're trying to keep it smooth. If you take up too much time, then your user is going to hear it. So how much time? Well, this is what a Vocera badge does. The top line there is non-DFS channels and this is to scale. So non-DFS channels, that's how long my Vocera badge is going to take to probe uh, in, the, in the, uh, the gold. And then the blue, that's it going back on channel to do some TX RX to keep its buffer and the audio going. The moment you, you choose a DFS channel, now I have to dwell over 100 milliseconds to hear a beacon before, so I can know if that channel is any good. And then, of course, because I've now been off channel for 100 milliseconds, I go back on channel for a huge blue chunk to try and fill my buffers again. And if you don't advertise SSID so I don't hear it in a beacon, now I actually have to probe on that channel once I've listened. So it gets even longer again. So um, 11K helps, but only partially. 11K can't stop you using DFS and requiring DF rules, DFS rules. It just reduces the number of DFS channels we have to scan um, and advertise your exercise in beacons every time. 20 megahertz hand channels. Um, we're only using eight channels, as we've just seen, right? Okay, so that's good. So we can't really afford to bond channels. If we've got an uh, eight channel plan, you really can't afford to bond. 
Voice doesn't need 20 megahertz, let alone 40. It's, you know, so there's no point bonding for voice. Um, and have 25, you need 25 SNR everywhere, you know, minus 67 uh, dBm. Well, once you start bonding, you're adding three or six dBm of noise, which makes getting an SNR even harder. So why would you give yourself the penalty of bonded channels when you're already struggling to provide two APs at minus 67 everywhere without bankrupting your CFO? AP power. When I started with Hasira in 2011, I was going around telling everyone to turn their APs down because they were on max power and um, we had too much CCI or CCC, however you want to call it. This year, I'm going around to everyone to turn their APs up because now we are all going so dense that our APs are dropping power levels down to uh, power level six, power level seven. And what that means is nice tiny cells and very little CCI or CCC, but it means my device is hopping every three meters and every hop eats into my jitter buffer and doesn't give me time to refill it. So now uh, you're hearing my roams. So, you know, you need to try and balance, uh, yes, keeping the spectrum nice and clean and leaving airtime free, but not also penalizing your clients that are mobile where they're roaming constantly. So, you know, put a leash on RM. I go to far too many customers where I see the default RM values for power transmit. And, you know, we're better than that. So just don't, just don't do it. You know, do a proper survey, survey with a certain power level and make sure you, you implement that when you deploy. Okay, APs and corridors are bad, right? Yeah, we don't like them, but sometimes they're needed when it comes to voice. If we look at this path I've got here. At point one, I've just come out of that room and my device is probably attached to uh, access point A. I turn that corner and when I get to two, I've actually put three more walls in my way potentially. So the signal drops very, very quickly and I have to suddenly scramble to roam. So the client probably roams to access point C. But then I turn another corner, carry on down the corridor, I'm now at point three, and now there's another two, three, or even four walls between me and C, so my signal drops again quickly. By putting access points at your transition points, yes, um, it means we have APs in the corridor, but it means I've got somewhere to go. And even if, and if you have 11K on as well, it's great, because A's told me about 11. So when I'm at, I'm at point two, I'm scanning for a channel I know I've, I can see around me. And when I get on 11, it's giving me a neighbor report for, for G. Uh, so when I get on F, I'm getting a neighbor report for access point G. So when I get around to point three, I find G quickly and have a nice smooth transition. I'm not saying fill your core access points, but think about the transition points of your clients and where they might well, commonly walk um, and try and provide some sort of signal there. <laughs> um, we want fast roams every time. Appreciate keys nice, quick and consistent. But what is quicker than pre-shared key, as I said yesterday, is 11R, CCKM, or OKC. So please do use those if you're going to use dot one x Do not make a voice client perform full radius every single time. You will have a break in your audio every single time you roam. Okay, no subnet roaming. You know, 400 milliseconds, that's really quick, right? No biggie. But actually to a voice client that wants 150 milliseconds, a DHCP exchange can be really long. So don't have us roaming between subnets when we're changing floors or even going between buildings ideally. Give, us, give your voice clients one big subnet that they can just sit in and not have to change IP. Um, so we do DHCP only association. And then set the least time for an entire shift ideally particularly in somewhere like healthcare, uh, where they're doing long shifts, do a long lease time. I know that makes the pool big and it has to be even bigger. But again, if these are your important clients, you need to stick to this. Okay, quas end to end. Not much to say here, but apart from it is complex. Getting quas working through the whole land because you don't know what path that voice is gonna take from a client at one side of the building to the other, it is complex. But quite frankly, suck it up. That's why we're here. That's why we get paid to do what we're doing, right? So just get it working. It's a requirement of voice. Um, if you don't get it, you know, I see all too often the voice client is sending as voice, fantastic, up it goes, but actually when it's skipping down to the next uh, client on the way downstream, it's, it's just been downgraded because somewhere in your network you've not maintained that tagging. <sighs> Last, designing for lifts and elevators. If you are able to put um, access points in your lifts uh, slash elevators, then do so. But do not do this if you do that. If you've got a APs in your lifts, great. Don't put an AP in the lobby because the client is sat there with fantastic signal, really enjoying the experience. It steps in the lift, the doors close, it drops through a reinforced concrete shaft and it just disappears. 
So what you want to do is this, provide edge of cell coverage in the lift bay. That way the voice client is in there, it's still got what it needs, but right at the periphery. So it's able to have a conversation it needs to, but it's starting to do that probing. It's starting to find out where it can go, maybe sending out requests for neighbors. That way when the lift doors open and it's already scanning, it's gonna pick up the beacons very quickly. Um, and as you step in the lift, it might have transitioned before the lift doors even close and you won't notice. And if you think that's a myth, I've got a customer in Belfast who has seamless in and out of voice transition with our product because using an eight channel plan with uh, lifts, um, APs in the lift and not putting them, the APs in the lift bay itself. So with that, thank you very much. Do better voice. Woo!